G'day everyone, I'm Ebony Bennett, I'm Deputy Director at the Australia Institute and welcome to our webinar series and thanks for joining us today. It's been a couple of weeks since we've had a webinar and we're so glad you're joining us today. I'd like to begin by acknowledging um, the traditional owners of the land on which we live and work. Based here in Canberra, this is Ngunnawal and Nambri country, and I pay my respects to elders past and present. And I encourage anyone who's wondering about the referendum later on in the year to head on over to the Uluru Statement from the Heart. Give it a read, check it out for yourself and get involved and get informed about the referendum coming later in the year. Uh, we do do webinars uh, at different days and times, so please head on over to the Australia Institute's website to find our upcoming webinars. The next one that we've got coming up is uh, from uh, with Bridget Archer, the Tasmanian uh, Liberal MP, so you can head on over to our website and find those upcoming webinars. And lastly, um, a reminder that the uh, uh, this is being recorded live today and we will put up a recording of it uh, on our YouTube channel, that's Australia Institute uh, .tv and you can find that later uh, and share it on social media and other things. A couple of tips for today uh, just to help things run smoothly. You can type questions for our panellists into the Q&A box that should be on the bottom of your screen and you should be able to upvote other people's questions as well. A reminder to please keep things civil and on top topic in the chat or we will remove you and finally um, yeah this is a, a live event but it is being recorded so this issue of uh, Australian foreign affairs is out now a lot of you have ordered it from our emails it's called we need to talk about America an alliance in flux and it really examines um, Australia's evolving ties with the United States and as the power balance in uh, Asia changes and as Washington continues to face bitter domestic divides. It's obviously a very timely addition uh, as China is increasingly painted as more or less enemy number one and the US as the defender of democracy and against autocracy to channel President Biden, um, it's important that we reassess where Australia might fit into all of this. And the essays in here offer a number of different counterpoints. So I really encourage you to buy a copy if you haven't read it yet. Um, and it's a pretty upbeat edition of Australian foreign affairs, which isn't always the case. But there's, a, a, I think, a lot of optimistic views here about the Australia-US relationship. Um, and uh, things like the, the Trump presidency notwithstanding. So I think we'll get into a lot of interesting um, discussions today. So today uh, I'm delighted to introduce our panel. Sam Rogovine is Director of the Lowy Institute's International uh, um, Security Program. He's the author of The Echidna Strategy, Australia's Search for Power and Peace, which is out now. I believe. Uh, Dr. Emma Shortis is a historian, writer and commentator focused on the history and politics of the United States and her first book, Our Exceptional Friend, Australia's Fatal Alliance with the United States, was published by Hardy Grant in 2021. Emma's a lecturer in the Social and Global Studies Centre at RMIT University and Alan Bean is my colleague here at the Australia Institute. He's got long experience in international policy, national security policy and defence policy and he heads up our international and security affairs program. Uh, so I'm delighted Delighted to have you all join us today. Um, welcome, Emma, Sam and Alan. Uh, Emma, if I can begin with you, uh, Donald Trump looms large over the recent political history of the United States and I think fair to say remains a bit of a, a cloud on the horizon as well. Um, is Ambassador Rudd's earlier disdain for Trump reciprocated, we assume, uh, a problem waiting to happen, or is Kevin Rudd's truth to power strategy, whoever might win the presidency, a sign of maturity? That's something that you get stuck into um, in, in your essay. Yeah, look, thanks, Ebony. I thought the, um, the moment of Rudd's appointment as ambassador was a really telling one. It really revealed a lot, I think, about Australia's relationship with the United States in the era of Trump and, and almost how much it hasn't changed because there was a lot of hand-wringing in the media when Rudd was appointed about his kind of fair and frank criticism of Trump, you know, which he had delivered on Twitter. 
And there was a lot of kind of, um, I guess, underlying concern that should Trump or, or someone like Trump come back into the White House, that Rudd's job, because of this criticism about Trump's attack on democracy, you know, that Rudd's job would become really difficult and Australia might be abandoned. You know, Trump might do the thing where he decides he hates someone and, and kind of locks them out and Australia would be abandoned and we'd be kind of left alone here in the Pacific, frightened and afraid. And, and for me, that assumption just said so much about how we see the United States because kind of the assumption under the assumption there is that under a Trump presidency mark two, which we know would be significantly worse than the first time around because he he told us that, the assumption was that we would want to maintain a similar security relationship, a similar alliance with that Trump White House. And for me, that's something that's quite frightening to consider. And I think that we're not really talking enough about not just what it would look like, what the alliance would look like under a Trump presidency, Mark II, but, but what the alliance should look like, what we want it to look like and how much room we've got to move within the alliance as it exists should Trump return to power. Mm. And can you just expand on that um, a little bit? What are some of the things that you think we need to be um, talking about when we're considering what that um, alliance looks like? Well, I think we need to really confront the the potential reality of a Trump return to the White House legitimately or otherwise and really have a frank conversation here about what our red lines would be in the event of that happening and how we might be able to respond as a nation to that eventuality. But I think, you know, to, to I guess to be more optimistic about it, to turn that around, I think we should also be really focusing in on what we have in common now with the Biden administration and the Albanese government, both of whom are elected on very gently progressive, but progressive nonetheless, progressive platforms. And I think we should be really leaning into that solidarity, progressive solidarity with the United States and, and being the best friend that we can and really reinforcing that democratic solidarity with the United States in order to, to really, hopefully, I suppose, bring out the best in, in both of our nations. Mm. Sam, if I can come to you next, um, the title of your essay is Target Australia, Is the Alliance Making Us Less Safe? Uh, uh, it was a, a fascinating read for me, who's not across um, defence policy, perhaps in the same way that you are. Can you just tell us um, a little bit, you explore the strategic impl implications for America's growing defence footprint in Northern Australia. For lay people like myself, can you um, kind of explain the context of that and some of the issues um, that you've raised there um, about that, um, uh, the strategic implications for Australia? Ooh, hang on. Thank you very much. Um, uh, and, and thank you for the invitation today. Uh, the, the echidna strategy actually is out at the end of this month. Um, so look out for it. Um, so that it's it's been too little remarked upon, but the, the alliance has undergone uh, perhaps very little short of transformational change over the last couple of years. Um, and the centerpieces of that, which I describe in the essay, are um, first of all uh, news that was revealed uh, by the ABC, which is that the United States would be basing, um, not not basing, but at least rotating uh, bomber aircraft through northern Australia regularly, and new facilities will be built at the Tyndall Air Base uh, just south of Darwin. Uh, to host up to six American strategic bombers. Uh, and they'll be rotating through there regularly. There'll be new fuel supplies built there. There'll be new uh, armament stores built there. The significance of that is not just the expansion and not just the fact that it's bombers, because we've we've actually had American bombers visiting Australia for a long time now. The difference is that this is an operational presence. It's not about training anymore. This is about America putting bombers on Australian soil uh, that will actually fight if it if it comes down to it. So Amer American bombers would be flying operational missions from Australian air bases in the event of war in the Pacific. Uh, the second move along those lines, and, and probably more significant in military terms, was the announcement in March of uh, uh, of the, the, the path that AUKUS was going to take. And, and part of that announcement in San Diego was the creation of something called Submarine Rotational Force West, which is a proposal uh, to put uh, to create facilities at uh, in Perth at the naval base uh, in in uh, Perth 
to host up to four American uh, nuclear powered attack submarines and potentially one UK nuclear powered attack submarines. And this would start as early as 2027. And the idea is uh, partly to help disperse American forces around the region, but also to familiarize Australian, uh, the Australian Navy with these ships preparatory to our uh, acquiring our own submarines under the AUKUS program. Now, the argument I make in the piece, uh, oh, and, and by the way, it's, it's worth saying that, that um, these two uh, major proposals were reinforced again by the, the OSMIN talks just, just concluded in Brisbane, which made further announcements about uh, American, uh, the American military presence in Australia. And the argument I make in the piece is that, first of all, this is a major shift in the alliance. Um, we haven't seen operational US forces uh, in Australia since the Second World War, and as as Hugh White put it, I think rather neatly, we're we're NATOizing the uh, the alliance, um, so that it, it is a it is a close operational um, arrangement between the two countries, uh, and it inevitably will make Australia a target. Um, it 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 means that Australia would be the target of uh, of Chinese long range uh, bombers. Uh, Chinese uh, ballistic missiles, uh, because we are hosting US forces that will be designed to hit China in the event of a war. Now, you know, that, that's not totally new in our experience. We've done that before. I mean, we've, we've had the joint facilities, which almost certainly were, uh, were targets of Soviet uh, bombers and Soviet missiles. But the question we have to ask ourselves now is when with the, uh, with the alliance taking on this new dimensions, is it still worth it? Does it does it still make Australia safer? I think on balance it probably doesn't. Uh, but the, the the idea of the piece was really to raise that question, which it seems to me has been uh, has been uh, underappreciated. Yeah, I completely agree, and it was such a good piece to raise those issues because it does feel like uh, an issue that hasn't really received airing in you know public debate um, that it needs but that does bring us to AUKUS Alan which is something that's been your most recent hobby of, of research um, so what's your take on this shift as Sam was explaining it look I think Sam is right on the money uh, this is a, a significant development in the way in which Australia is prepared to commit itself to a set of operations and activities that hitherto it has just not done, uh, as Sam says, not since the Second World War. Uh, apart from making ourselves a target, and I agree with Sam, that is the effect, I think it does something which is uh, equally significant and perhaps even more significant in the short term. And that is, I think it precludes us from exercising a whole lot of other options. Um, the moment you decide that you're going to have deployable strategic forces, and that's what we're talking about here, uh, on our continent, aimed at only one putative threat, then we have already taken a decision that we are in play. Uh, we may not have taken a decision that we're going to deploy our own forces, uh, 5,000 kilometres north of Australia, but we have taken a decision to be on side with the United States in the event that it needs, for one reason or another, to deploy its own forces. So this is a very big decision. It's a decision which has crept up on most of us. Um, I mean, we've, we've been familiar with B-52s in Australia since the early 80s, um, but we had a lot of conditionality on those. Um, it was the government's policy of the day that such B-52s had to fly for half an hour or so at 500 feet, uh, much to the annoyance of chicken farmers in northern Australia. Uh, but the purpose of that was that it provided an automatic uh, guarantee, really, that those aircraft were not armed with nuclear weapons, um, because notwithstanding the non-confirm nor deny policy, uh, the Americans had another policy as part of their Broken Arrows program, which was that they wouldn't carry nuclear weapons on training flights at 500 feet. So we denuclearized the B-52s, but still welcomed them for training purposes. 
Now we're, we're welcoming them for operational purposes. And that I think is a, a very significant change in our own posture with respect to Asia. And it feels like one that, um, as we were just talking about, it, it, the Australian public hasn't really appreciated this shift or the implications for it. Um, how important is it for us to have these, these conversations and start airing out some of these concerns or even just get people to appreciate that there has been this kind of dramatic shift? Look, given the nature of the consequences, it's critically important in a democracy that the electorate at least has knowledge, if not some say, in how its own treasure and potentially its own blood are going to be used. Uh, in the case of, of the B-52s and more particularly uh, in the case of AUKUS, we're contemplating not only hosting uh, American and British submarines uh, in Western Australia, but we're contemplating the ownership and operation of our own uh, nuclear powered attack submarines on both the Western and the Eastern seaboards of Australia. And the only purpose for those submarines is to be able to take war a long, long way north uh, and indeed into the, the ocean approaches of China itself. Now, they're very, very big actions, and they're the things, I think, on which the, the Australian population really does need to engage, uh, that they are of the utmost seriousness. Mm. Ebony, um, Ebony, it's, it's just worth adding, actually, that to the extent that the Australian public does know about this, they're actually pretty relaxed about it. We poll... The, uh, we poll Australian attitudes to various foreign policy issues every year. The 2023 poll found that 57% of Australians are in favour of further US basing in Australia. And note that we used the more emotive term of basing. The government actually avoids that. They refer to rotation, even though the distinction is really you know, pretty difficult to maintain, particularly when you're building permanent facilities here. But mm. nevertheless, Australians seem pretty relaxed about it. Mm. Uh, that is very interesting. Um, Emma, to come back to you and the kind of uh, the bigger picture about the, the US-Australia alliance, you write um, persuasively on the relationship between values, interests, democracy that you were kind of talking about earlier, and the rules-based order as set up by the US um, as well as the kind of capital A alliance, as you call it. Um, at its core, how do you see that relationship um, with the US and, and what it's all about? Is it all about security? What is it about? I, th I think it's a really good question, Ebony. It's, a, it's not, a e a not an easy one to answer. And I think Sam's point about polling is a really important one and a really closely related one because, of course, Sam's right that, that consistently Australians who are polled are, are in favour of the alliance, broadly speaking. But if you kind of dig down into those numbers, there was a, a recent study by done by the United States Study Centre. There is some real murkiness around Australians' understanding of the alliance and what it is actually for. So we know very, very clearly what the alliance is against. AUKUS makes that very clear. But Australians are sort of uncertain about what it's for and are, and are looking for a more positive articulation of the alliance and what it can achieve. And I think that's a really important factor that that often doesn't get um, or, or gets overshadowed by the kind of laser focus on security when we're talking about the capital A alliance, that it's about kind of hard headed calculations of national interest. And it and it's all focused on, you know, very much what Sam was writing about in terms of that defense relationship and interoperability or whatever ridiculous term we want to use when we're talking about that relationship. But the relationship is, of course, much deeper than that. And, and the almost the conflict between, you know, what we can loosely call interests and, and values is creates a, what I think is really a fundamental confusion because when you focus overwhelmingly on those hard, you know, so-called hard-headed security interests, we do that almost inevitably at the expense of what is supposed to be and what we're consistently told is the core fundamental value of the alliance and that is democracy and shared democracy. Even though it's kind of, it's a bit weird to speak about democracy as a value, that's, that's what the alliance does. You will hear consistently um, high profile people, prime ministers, presidents talking about shared values between the United States and Australia and that's inevitably democracy. 
But the way that the alliance plays out in Australia, as Alan was just saying, is deeply anti-democratic. You know, we have AUKUS kind of sprung on us 11 o'clock at night. Those of us who are still on Twitter start seeing little murmurs about this. And then there's an announcement made all of a sudden with no public discussion that Australia is going nuclear and, and everything that came along with that, and as Alan and Sam have pointed out so clearly, is a huge decision for Australia and for an Australian public that has for decades been vehemently opposed to any kind of nuclear industry in Australia, to, to the advent of nuclear in any form in Australia. And that, that contradiction, I think Australians are deeply aware of that and are, and are really uncomfortable with it. And as as yet, I think that there seems to be at least a, a moment opening where we can talk about that in an open way that we haven't um, in the past, in the recent past at least. And, you know, maybe we've got Trump to thank for that a little bit. Um, but I think it's really important to, to acknowledge those contradictions at the heart of the alliance and to start to unpick them because that's really the only way, I think, that we can change the alliance in a way that I would, would argue that we need to. Mm. Um, just sticking with um, Trump, I, I hate to let him overshadow everything, but um, it's inevitable. just thinking about um, democracy and what is happening in the United States at the moment, uh, where we have seen, uh, you know, obviously the indictments um, uh, against Trump for the role in the January 6th insurrection. Uh, at a lot of times during the Trump presidency and uh, in, in more recent um, times, US democracy uh, seems to be under a bit more threat uh, as well or a little bit shakier than it has been um, in the past. How much do you think that dynamic actually puts the spotlight on the importance of democracy as a shared value and, and interest or however, however we want to describe it? Because you know, it, it seems to be um, something that's a bit of a, a domestic problem in the US at the moment. Does it make us think about um, how much we value democracy differently and, and view that relationship in, in a different way? I, I mean, I think it does. I think it, it simultaneously makes Australians focus on and value our own democracy, I, I think, much more and appreciate um, the guardrails that we have in place. That's been a really important conversa ongoing conversation, I think, in Australia. And I think there's significant concern rightly in Australia about the state of American democracy um, and and huge attention of course paid to what not just what Trump is doing but what's happening for example at the state level in the United States but I do think there is a real tendency um, at least in mainstream discussion in Australia to separate those two things you know to treat exactly as you were saying Ebony to treat what's happening in US politics as a domestic issue that's mostly isolated to what happens in the United States, As aside from some sort of conversations and hand-wringing about AUKUS and what Trump, you know, a Trump presidency might do to AUKUS, there's not enough, as far as I'm concerned, a connection made between what's happening domestically in the United States and how that will and is impacting the United States' role in the world. You know, when President Biden talks about democracy versus autocracy, and, and that's kind of the state of international relations at the moment. The way he deploys democracy internationally, I think, is very different to his understanding of democracy at home. And it, and it is really hard to kind of, I think, reconcile those two things because, you know, for better or worse, the state of US democracy is not just a domestic concern for Americans. It's a, it's a concern for all of us. Mm. Ebony, Ebony to, to, to Emma's point, and I'm sorry for the interruption, but um, it, it is extraordinary to me that uh, uh, when you consider the timing of AUKUS, so the, the initial pitch that was made by the Morrison government's senior officials uh, uh, to the Biden administration came, I think, around three months after uh, the Biden administration took office, which is to say, uh, you know, the, the paint was barely dry on the US Capitol after the 6th January riots. And yet it, that, that seemed to impinge not at all on Australian reasoning about a project that was that was going to last for generations. Um, that in itself, that, that seems an extraordinary judgment to me. Now, I, I actually personally am, I think, slightly more optimistic about the future of American democracy than perhaps Emma is. But still, that strikes me as an amazing... Uh, an amazing blind spot for for Australia that we would dive into this thing uh, 
uh, barely a few months after yeah. after that presidency and that event. Yeah, um, and if I can follow up with you, Sam, um, I guess uh, I want to come back to that idea of what the actual threat is to Australia with the the shift that we're seeing um, in the relationship through AUKUS. So. What is the threat if there is one? Um, is it Chinese aggression? Is it, as you were talking about earlier, um, us being more of a target because now we're involved um, operationally? Are we, are, should we be concerned about strategic errors on America's part? What are some of the issues that we need to be thinking about? Well, the first thing I'd say is that it, to to be a, uh, a skeptic about these arrangements and to be a skeptic about AUKUS as I am, does not then imply that one somehow minimizes or excuses uh, the rise of China. I think that's a mistake that's sometimes made. I think Paul Keating falls into that error from time to time. Um, he is, to my mind, far too sanguine about the rise of China as a strategic power, as a military power, uh, and about its ambitions abroad. I generally share the, um, you know, the mainstream view about, uh, uh, the mainstream Western view about uh, the risk of, of China's rise for um uh, for the Western-led order in Asia. Um, now, I, I, I believe I, that actually we're going to have to accommodate that to some degree rather than resist it entirely. Uh, but I do share the mainstream view of, uh, of the, the, the sheer scale of the challenge that China represents to that order and, and, and to our interests. Um, but that doesn't mean you have to support uh, the kind of arrangements that we're entering into now. Uh, and the real risk from those, I think, is that it entangles Australia in conflicts that actually are not vital to Australian interests. Mm. Um, so it, the, the United States may have decided that Taiwan, for instance, is a, uh, a vital interest. I actually don't think it is to the US. But if the United States has made that judgment, then we need to arrive at that judgment independently. And I think uh, in line with what Alan was saying, actually, we're, we're prejudging that question. But by entering into these arrangements, we're basically behaving as if that question is settled because we, we, we essentially will have no choice at that point. US forces will be operating from Australian facilities. And once Australia itself has nuclear powered submarines, the incentive to actually become involved will, I think, be so strong as to be overwhelming. You cannot have these tools which are expressly designed for such a conflict. And then when on the day that the balloon goes up, decide you're not going to use them. Right. So mm. essentially just making the, the decision to buy these assets will tie our hands in, the, in, in future. Uh, and I don't think that, the th that uh, uh, as terrible as the idea of a Chinese invasion of Taiwan is, I do not think it meets the threshold of being a vital interest to Australia over which we would risk potentially a nuclear war. Yeah. Um, Alan, if I can come to you next. Um... Uh, uh, Sam just mentioned Paul Keating's intervention. One thing I did think that uh, his intervention did was really, it felt like to me this was just um, a bipartisan thing. It was all done and dusted and we weren't really looking at too much into um, the nature of this agreement and whether you agree or disagree with him, it seemed to bust open the debate a little bit and, and um, give people the, the space to kind of interrogate this a little bit more. What are some of the things that you think the, um, not the Australian public, but the Australian body politic needs to be considering um, as we're moving forward with AUKUS and the purchase of these submarines and things? In the main, uh, Keating got the got the answer right. I mean, there was a lot of drama and, and theatre uh, around the way in which he did it at the press club. And um, in, so, in most respects, that's a pity because a lot of people were distracted by the drama and the theatre and missed the point of what he was really saying. But what he was saying, apart from his relative softness on China, was not very different, really, from what Sam just said. And I'd have to say, I, I totally agree with what Sam just said. It was very carefully nuanced language. Um, that our focus on China as a threat, I think, seriously distracts us from a focus on China and the myriad risks that we are facing because of China's rise, but the, the rise of China in so many different dimensions. 
economically, culturally, socially, politically, um, and not least of all, strategically. So we've got a hell of a lot on our plate at the moment, which I think we're looking at simply through the lens of the intelligence and security community, mm -hmm. which is where the initial overtures to the newly arrived Biden administration were made, and not properly through the lens of our foreign policy and security community, because it's the policy here that matters. And we, as I said earlier, we're, we're precluding uh, a lot of other foreign policy options by the choices we're making right now, in the same way as we are not looking at the opportunity costs associated with uh, an acquisition quite as momentous as that of the, the nuclear powered submarines. I mean, a projected cost at the moment of 368 billion uh, is frankly a guess, uh, looking at all other defense uh, acquisitions over the last 50 years or so, and I'm quite well positioned to look at those, um, uh, there'll be no change out of a trillion dollars for the orca submarines. So what we're looking at here is um, a, a, a change not only in our posture, which Sam touched on before, but we're looking at a significant change in our capability and the, the uh, force elements that we have uh, available to us in Australia. And, and these are very serious things. So I think Keating is right, um, but more importantly, uh, I do think that the Australian community at the moment is puzzled, it's uncertain, it's not responding much to the uh, AUKUS submarine decision, as, as uh, Sam said, but some parts of the community most certainly are. And um, it's yet to be seen exactly what happens at Labor's national conference in two weeks' time. But I do know that there is quite an amount of churn going on in, in uh, Labor Party branches at the moment as people consider what resolutions ought to be put up on the floor of that national conference. And just as in the past, we've had quite extraordinary resolutions put up on joint facilities and on uh, nuclear weapons, on nuclear power, nuclear power industry, uh, and indeed on many things. So we might expect that there could be a bit more stirring of the possum here. And I might just complete this set of remarks by noting that next Sunday and the Sunday after, there will be public demonstrations in both um, Sydney, which is a good place for demonstrations, but also Adelaide, which is not all that accustomed to demonstrations, um, actually on August, um, demonstrations associated with Hiroshima Day. And so uh, I think there may be some signs of uh, some part of the community at least beginning to, to respond to these decisions and to think, well, exactly what do these decisions mean for our own uh, agency, for our own independence as we go forward into an increasingly disrupted and an increasingly uncertain future. Mm. Um, I can see that we've got about 450 people on with us today. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, we are going to come to questions from the audience very shortly. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so just a reminder, you can type your questions into the Q&A box and you can upvote other people's questions as well um, for the panel. Um, uh, so I'll go now to a question from um, Roger Shelley, which is, uh, I might send this one to, to you, Emma. Uh, do you think we must be so craven towards the US and when might we be in a position to show even a small amount of independence from the United States? Uh, this is a question you, you won't be surprised to hear that it comes my way fairly fairly often. <laughs> um, look, I, you know, I'm not sure that that craven is is necessarily the word, though there, there's certainly been cases of, of that. I think, you know, uh, Australian governments are or have historically been um, over eager, I think, to to please the Americans and and so sort of focused on retaining American presence in the region um, at the expense of of kind of almost anything else and and but there are uh, some really important examples of where Australian governments have been 
a little bit more assertive has been have been as uh, you know as Simon Crean really um, quite famously now put it have been the best kind of friend to the United States in that you know we've told them when we think that they're going astray and there is room to move you know I think Australian governments have really underestimated the room that we do have to move with American administrations in in telling them what we think you know I think many Americans in very high places value Australian opinions on the Pacific in particular and historically we haven't use that I don't think we've used that very effectively um, very often and the question of independence for me is always a, a really tricky one because of course the assumption is you know when you're talking about the alliance when you're critically um, engaging with the alliance that you're advocating for more Australian independence whereas what I would I suppose what I would argue for is more interdependence for Australia with our region so rather than kind of seeking to act alone which is what independence suggests and, and make our own kind of solo decisions, I would advocate for developing, further developing our regional relationships and developing that interdependence, which means really conceiving of security um, in a radically different way to, to the way that it's conceived under the alliance. You know, it's, it's that goes back to that kind of hard-headed analysis, hard-headed analysis of security as opposed to conceiving of security as something collective and and particularly for us in the Pacific you know that would mean a kind of radical reconception of climate action for example and developing interdependence there in terms of climate action and so I don't think it's necessarily a kind of binary choice between alliance or or independence or being brave or being craven it's actually at, I would hope for and advocate for a much more sophisticated approach to Australia's role in the world. Um, Alan, and I might uh, throw to you on this one as well. I know that you've talked a lot about Australia fostering greater ties within the region, uh, particularly diplomatically. Um, what's your kind of response um, to Emma's comments and that question about independence? Oh, look, I think Emma's quite right. I, I don't think Australia is necessarily craven, though it is a word that I have used myself, I know. <laughs> um, but, but we are constantly deferential. Uh, as we saw just in the Osmin uh, sort of set pieces over the last few days, um, you know, we've, we've, we've just announced that we're going to make rockets and missiles for the United States. I mean, they will be American rockets, American designs, American missiles essentially manufactured in Australia. Well, I'm not quite sure what that means, but I'm, I'm sure it, it, it is a sign, though, is that we're doing something which we think will please the United States. Mm -hmm. And equally, the idea of a combined intelligence centre located here in Canberra, when we have enormous amounts of glass connecting Australia and the United States in the intelligence sphere, um, is a gesture, I think, but more a gesture of deference than it is a, a, a gesture of any form of intelligence independence, which brings us, of course, into, well, what do we do about that? As a deferential ally of the United States, we constrain uh, our ability to forge an interdependence, uh, a kind of semi-concert of nations in our own region. And we do that, I think, at enormous cost to ourselves. Um, it's clear to me from my own dealings with people in Malaysia and Indonesia just in the last year that it's still the case that they look at us with an enormous amount of puzzlement, wondering why on earth we find it so necessary to back in the Americans all the time when we've got a couple of pretty good products of our own that we could back into Southeast Asia, most particularly collaboration and cooperation with the ASEAN countries in particular in the development of uh, appropriate regional uh, sort of security regimes which meet the needs of everybody, particularly in the dialogue uh, room. Mm -hmm. So in all of this, uh, Emma's right. Uh, we do need to build up a much stronger sense of regional interdependence, but that's hard to do when we continue to signal our dependence on the US. Uh, the next question that I've got is from Armin Hicks, um, and I'll send this one to you, Sam. Um, do the panellists agree that the security risk has increased? Should we rely on balancing uh, with powerful partners or rely upon liberal global governance to manage great power competition? Uh, the short answer is yes, I do think that for Australia, the the, the military threat has increased somewhat. Um, 
th there's a whole section of my book devoted to this question, which is strangely neglected in Australia, actually. There's a, you know, we're, we're proposing to transform the entire Australian Defence Force uh, to meet the threat from China. And yet there is almost no detailed discussion in Australia of what, what exactly is the military threat that China poses to Australia. I mean, it's, it's, rare, it's, it's weirdly, uh, it's a weird lacuna in the national uh, conversation about this issue. When you do examine it closely, I think you'll find on the, you find first that, yes, the military threat has increased. So, for instance, the, the kind of military force that China can project against the Australian landmass is already greater than the Soviet Union ever could. Uh, but secondly, what I what I conclude from my analysis of it is that that threat is still relatively modest and we're protected very much by distance. Distance is Australia's single biggest uh, defence asset. And the problem I have with AUKUS and the broader direction that Australian defence policy is taking right now is that we're at pains to try to compress the distance between us and China when what we should be doing is exploiting it. So AUKUS is designed for us to build these, these submarines that are almost certainly designed to operate just off the Chinese coast and even to fire missiles onto the Chinese mainland. There is simply no need for Australia to take that posture. In fact, nobody even asked us to, not even the United States. We're doing it ourselves without being asked. Uh, so yes, the, the, the military threat has increased, but it's still manageable for Australia. Mm. Uh, Maybe if next... I can just add as well, Ebony. Yeah, um, please. Sorry. I, th I think Sam Sam's makes it, making a really good point about the way we discuss, you know, what this threat even is. But I think insofar as it is discussed, we we also kind of discuss it as if it's happening in a vacuum and that it would have happened, you know, that this would have been inevitable regardless of the actions of other states and other great powers like the United States. And I think there's a real reluctance to do any kind of self-examination in terms of the behaviour, particularly of the United States re regarding China and the decisions that we are making that Sam articulate so clearly in his piece and how they will solicit a response. And I think there's been a really dramatic failure of understanding and of empathy and also of calculation in terms of managing that rise. And it is astounding to me as a historian of American foreign policy that so much of this, of these assumptions are based on the idea that the Americans are good decision makers when it comes mm. to managing great power competition and I just don't think we've got historical evidence for that. Not recently, anyway. <laughs> no, it's a, it's a very good point. Um, the next question I've got here is from Kate Cooper, who says, we are subsidising the American and British submarine manufacturing industries to the tune of at least $370 billion. Why are we spending this money on long-term support effort when we get nothing in return today, not even the release of Julian Assange? And by the time we get the subs, the technology will be outdated. Is this a good use of our funds, Alan? <laughs> um, no. <laughs> but, but perhaps, I mean, it's, it's a very important question. And of course, the answer is no. Um, all of this is a, a giant political action on the part of the Morrison and uh, Albanese governments. Uh, at this point, the August decision has not got strategic definition because we simply don't have the submarines and we're not even sure we're going to get them. Uh, but nonetheless, in the Ford estimates, just around $4 billion has been provided to spend on essentially putting another shift uh, per day into the submarine uh, manufacturing uh, capacity of the United States so that it can work 24-7. And that's the only way, by the way, that we would ever be able to acquire even two Virginia-class submarines from the Americans. There are a whole lot of them that need repair at the moment, and they're simply waiting for repair because there's not enough capacity in the United States. So, no, of course, the, the, the money is, is um, at this stage, projected, and uh, it, it doesn't to my mind, represent serious value for money for all of the reasons that Sam just touched upon before. Now, linking it to Julian Assange, in a way, of course, they're not linked issues, but it just shows, doesn't it, that the dismissal of Australia's interest in having Julian Assange freed so easily uh, by Blinken on the grounds that Although the United States has said that there were no 
risks to the United States coming out of the WikiLeaks, Blinken nonetheless says, well, um, it was risky to do that, so he's got to be tried. And it, it just again demonstrates what happens when you are more deferential and more of an acolyte to the United States than a country which is able to say, no, this is actually something we want. So well, hand it over. I would just add, Ebony, that uh, I mean, it's not true that we'll get nothing for the 268 or 368 billion that we're proposing to spend, or probably more, as Alan has uh, rightly pointed out. Unless you think that all defence spending is inherently wasteful or, or is un, completely unnecessary, then we will get actually we'll get rather a lot. We'll, we, we will get unprecedented new naval capabilities, and I would argue much more capability than we need. I think uh, we, we can defend ourselves affordably much closer to our borders than than we can under the kind of force structure that's imagined uh, under AUKUS. But it, it's certainly not true that we're getting nothing. In fact. Probably the opposite problem applies. We're getting too much capability and capability that will draw us into conflicts that we have no business being involved in. I would just lost that too, Sam. I mean, in some respects, getting too much is getting nothing. Um, and it really is that we, we probably won't have uh, the ability to exercise sovereignty over the entire capability. In fact, um, on, on some analysis which has just been done at the ANU, uh, a PhD by Graham Dunk, uh, it would appear that with respect to the Virginia class at least, we will have very little sovereignty to be exercised on that submarine, whereas we had a considerable amount of sovereignty that could be exercised on, uh, on the Collins. So it's, it's a question of spending a lot of money to appear to get something big, but in fact, to get a whole host of liabilities. And I think that's what I would mean by saying, we're not going to get anything for a vast expenditure, except headaches. Mm. Um, the next question that I've got, um, I might send to you, Emma. It's from Richard Bentley, and he asks about peacekeeping and peace building um, being deserving of as much or more investment than uh, defence and that we have a sense of our investment in defence and the, the constant media hype around all this. Um, how do we uh, kind of shift this debate to make it bigger than just security or the other elements that, um, that would keep us secure? I mean, I wish I knew. <laughs> um, look, I think I... I the question is is a good one, and I think the premise is correct in that um, not just AUKUS, but the ANZUS Treaty, Australia Security Treaty with the United States, um, locks us into this, I suppose, way of understanding the world and understanding security in particular, um, which assumes that conflict is inevitable. And you see that in the way that mainstream conversations play out around the China threat, you know, that this idea that great power competition is inevitable, conflict is inevitable, war is inevitable, we just kind of have to manage that. Instead of flipping that, which is what I would argue that we need to do to, to, pre to prevention and to into active peace building rather than just a passive kind of prevention or the fiction, for example, of nuclear deterrence that Alan has written about so beautifully. And, and flipping to, to peace building is, I mean, it's less expensive for one thing. It shouldn't cost you a trillion dollars, as, as Alan just pointed out. But it's also, I think, a really um, could be a way in which Australia played an incredibly important and positive role, not just in our region, but in the world. And our you know, our Pacific family, as our governments like to, to describe them, are crying out for that kind of approach to the region in particular. And, you know, the Australian government keeps making statements about wanting to be the strategic partner of choice in the Pacific, for example, and our Pacific neighbours are telling us the only way for us to be that, to play that role is to act on climate, is to radically act, to decarbonise immediately and our government is refusing to do that. And it's really only, I think, through that kind of peace building, and that is genuinely peace building because climate global boiling, as we are now we now should be calling it, is a is, is a bigger threat than anything to, to our region and, and to the people who live in our region. And so flipping to that kind of peace building, I would argue, is is so much more important than spending a trillion dollars on submarines. But I think I think I'm probably preaching to the converted um 
with Richard, but but I think it's a really important conversation to have because it is that real, it could be that real positive articulation of the alliance and of Australia's Australia's role in the world that we're just not talking about and we're told by hard-headed security types that we're not allowed to talk about because it's not serious. But it is serious and I think we should say that really loudly and really often. Emma, I'd just add to that that next Tuesday afternoon, um, Penny Wong and Pat Conroy are going to announce the government's new international development assistance policy at Parliament House. And I would hope that that presages um, a much more coordinated diplomatic and strategic policy in Australia, which leads to at least some significant change in the funding levels for both foreign affairs as a, as a national institution and for the aid budget in general, that the questioner has, has really identified an important thing. There's a kind of bottomless pit opening up on defence expenditure going well beyond 2% of GDP. And yet our, our financing of development assistance and of our own diplomatic efforts globally and in the region um, have been very constrained over the last two decades. And so I think that uh, a reorientation uh, towards a, a much more energised diplomatic and development assistance practice would be an enormous uh, investment for Australia in creating that kind of interconnected, interdependent world, which evidently is the basis of, of sound long-term regional security. Uh, just coming uh, back to that issue of security where Alan has just landed, Sam, I just wondered um, for viewers at home who uh, uh, aren't necessarily uh, experts in this, I just wondered if you could um, explain again the nature of the shift that we're seeing in Australia's defence policy as a result of AUKUS and the agreements that we're getting into. You've talked a lot about what these submarines can be used for and that we could, if we kind of stuck with where we were prior to this shift and, and defence of the the mainland, things would look different. What are the what is the alternative from this shift that we're pursuing, um, and and how is how is the shift different to what we previously had? If you could just kind of give people a, a little bit of context um, for for those of us who aren't experts. Yeah, thank you. Well, the the first point to say is that we we tend to think about defence policy in this very um, uh, in perhaps a linear way that we develop detailed policies first through you know, documents such as white papers. Uh, they lay out a certain strategy and certain priorities. From that, we derive the, the, the government and the Defence Department derives um, uh, judgments about what they need to buy, the kind of equipment they need to buy. And then we implement that. We, we get the equipment and then we implement the strategy. But in reality, it all it although it does work that way, it doesn't only work that way. It works the other way around too. So we think that policy creates capabilities, but capabilities can drive policy as well. So the point I've been trying, I think I tried to make earlier, was that once you have these capabilities, and in this instance, nuclear powered submarines, which are expressly designed to operate thousands of kilometres from Australia's shores, uh, to hem the Chinese Navy in along its coastline, and to fire missiles onto the Chinese mainland. Once you have those capabilities, it will be very difficult to say no to our ally when they ask us to use them, uh, which inevitably they will in the event of a conflict. So in effect, having the capability creates the decision uh, to, uh, uh, to use it. So the alternative that I've that I've sketched in uh, in the book is basically to take a leaf out of out of China's book, which is uh, the, the, the Chinese have uh, have perfected over many decades now what strategists call A two A D, which is uh, anti access area denial. And I'll and I'll stop using uh, uh, acronyms and, and terminology now. It's it's just to say that in in modern uh, military conditions. Uh, the, the, the technology favours the side that's doing the defending. It's very hard to project power over the oceans. 
and it's very relatively easy and relatively cheap to stop countries from projecting power over the oceans. And so that's where Australia can invest. It doesn't need to be particularly uh, uh, expensive for Australia to defend itself, to defend its northern approaches from air attack and from sea attack, simply by focusing on capabilities that can stop uh, aircraft and ships from getting close to us. Um, that, that is an affordable strategy for Australia, even outside the terms of the alliance, if that were ever to become necessary. Mm. Sam's completely right on that. That's exactly how to think about it. Yeah. Thank you for summarising that, Sam. I just felt like that was maybe a, a useful place for us to end because I feel like a lot of people are just kind of getting into this discussion now and don't necessarily have um, an appreciation of some of those. So uh, thank you for that excellent um, summary. Uh, we've only got um, a little bit more time left, so um, I'm going to throw uh, a bit of a curveball at you, Emma. I've got a question here about the influence of Rupert Murdoch and News Corp on American politics and culture and how that might affect the alliance. So just a nice, easy one, you know, to finish up. How long have I got? Another half an hour? <laughs> But I, look, it, it is a really um, deeply important question. And again, um, we don't talk about it enough and we don't connect it enough to Australia's role in the world and to the alliance in particular. You know, we, we kind of treat our analysis of the United States on two tracks, on the domestic and the international, and we don't link them. And, and Murdoch is a really... Um, nice isn't the right word. Murdoch is a way, a way to do that, I think, an important way to do that. And we again, really need to face head on, I think, what that media empire has done and particularly how it has reinforced um, deeply networked um, far-right movements and organisations between Australia and the United States. And, and I think making sure that our guardrails are in place in terms of the integrity of our own democracy and our own polity are, are always important, but also recognising the way that, you know, through not just Murdoch, but through those um, structures, so often the worst in American politics is reinforced, reinforced by the worst of Australian politics. And so often our relationship brings out the worst in our two countries rather than cultivating the virtues. And, and we can forget them, but there are virtues there. And that goes back to that democratic solidarity that I was talking about earlier and that I think we should be focusing on collectively, um, you know, and sidelining Murdoch as much as we possibly can. Uh, well, we are going to have to wrap it up there. Thank you to everyone who has joined us today. This is issue 18 of Australian Foreign Affairs. We need to talk about America. And I want to thank Dr. Emma Shortis, Sam Rogovine and Alan Bean for the wonderful discussion today. And thank you to everyone who sent through uh, questions for the panel. I'm sorry, as always, that we can't get to all of them. Um, but I feel like we've covered a lot of terrain in today's <laughs> discussion. Um, and it probably won't be the last time we touch on this topic. So do make sure that you head on over to australiainstitute.org.au to see all our upcoming webinars and tune into our podcast, Follow the Money, as well. And don't forget to buy your copy of Australian Foreign Affairs. Uh, there is a special offer for Australia Institute supporters that uh, we've got the details in the email there uh, if you want to grab your copy today. Thank you so much for joining us today, everyone, and thanks for a wonderful conversation, and we'll see you all again very soon. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.